a couple days ago i shared a new website template with the pro members one of the perks they get at the end of every month if you are interested in grabbing the files you can check out the pro membership using the link in the description as usual the template includes a handful of animations inspired by the projects we have built here on this channel but out of everything in that build one effect stood out the most this block reveal page transition you have probably seen variations of this effect on a lot of award winning sites it's used in different concepts but the core idea stays the same a grid of blocks handling the transition from one view to the next we haven't covered this transition on the channel before and since i had already built it for the template i thought it would be a good opportunity to recreate this effect in next js as well the original version in the template was written in vanilla javascript so this video is specifically for those of you building in the app router for this video i put together a small project powered by that exact block reveal transition using next.js the whole thing comes in at under 100 lines of code thanks to next transition router and gsap in this video i'll show you how you can create such seamless page transitions in your own next.js projects using the router simple leave and enter callbacks you can plug in gsap framer motion or pretty much any animation library you want the setup stays just as easy if you enjoy builds like this in next.js don't forget to leave a like on the video and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already and if you'd like to access the source code for this project along with hundreds of other similar micro projects and a brand new website template every month you can check out the pro membership through the link in the description all right let's jump into the code all right so before we jump into the actual build i've already set up a brand new next.js project using create next app and it's running locally here on the site before we start adding anything, I want to clear out all the default CSS that comes with the starter template. First, I'd open the global CSS file and wipe everything out just so we can work with a clean style sheet from the beginning. Then I'll do the same for page module CSS file. We won't be using any of the pre-built styles, so I'm removing those as well. Now I'll switch over to the home page and remove the default imports at the top. And since we are replacing all the boilerplate markup with our own layout, I'll get rid of the starter HTML as well. Before we start building the pages themselves, let's also drop in the assets we are going to use. Inside the public directory, I'll paste the four images I downloaded from Freepik. These will help us add the backgrounds across the different screens later on. With the starters files cleaned up and our assets in place, we are ready to begin setting up the actual pages. Inside the app directory, I'll add three new folders and name them Gateway, Station and Colony. Each of these folders will hold its own page.js file which will act as the individual screens for our little demo. Once the folders are in place, I'll go ahead and create a page.js file inside each one. These will work exactly like the home page. They are just separate routes that Next.js handles for us automatically. Now, let's jump back into the home page file and start defining the structure for this layout. We are going to keep things extremely minimal here. Each page will return a single full screen section containing just two elements, a background image and a header title. So I'll add that structure to the home page first. One wrapper section, a background image sitting behind everything, and a heading centered on the screen. With that done, I'll repeat the same pattern for the other three pages. Each one gets its own section with an image and the page title in the center. Nothing complicated, as we are going to focus mainly on the page transition part for this video. Alright, now that all four pages are in place, let's quickly add a navigation bar so you can move between them. Inside the source directory, I'll create a new folder called components and inside it, I'll make a new file called nav.jsx. This component will hold the navigation for the entire site. The nav itself is going to stay very straightforward. First, I'll import the link component from Next.js, then I'll return four links, each pointing to one of the routes we just created. Home base, gateway, station, and colony. With that done, the component is ready to use. To actually display it on every page, we need to add it to our root layout. So I'll open up the layout file and clean up anything we don't need, including the default font setup. We are going to bring in our own fonts later when we start styling. At the very top of the file, I'll import the nav component we just created and then place it inside the body so it shows up across the entire site. And as you can see on the side, the navigation bar is now visible and all four pages are fully functional. We can click through them and everything loads exactly as expected. Now that the base structure is in place, let's move on to styling. So I'll open up the global CSS file and bring in the fonts and define the overall look and feel of the layout. At the very top, I'll input two typefaces we are going to use throughout the project. The first one is a bold display font for the large headings and the second one is a clean monospaced font that we'll use mainly for the navigation links. Next, I'll define a few color variables inside the root selector. 
These will act as our main palette, a light color, a mid-tone, and a darker accent. Using variables keeps everything consistent and makes it easier to reuse the same tones across the entire project. After that, I'll set up a quick reset by removing default margins and paddings and switching everything to border box sizing. For the body styling, I'll set the background to the mid-tone color and the text color to the lighter one. For all the images inside the project, I'll make sure they fill their containers and keep their proportions. Next, I'll style the main headings, I'll use the display font we imported earlier, transform everything to uppercase and give it a bold, compact look. The font size will scale smoothly across different screen sizes and the line spacing is kept tight. For the links, mainly inside our navigation, I'll use the monospaced font, keep everything uppercase and remove the default decorations. The lighter color keeps them readable on darker backgrounds. Now let's style the navigation itself. I'll position it at the bottom of the screen and center it horizontally. The nav is displayed as a simple row of links with a small gap between them. Each link sits on a dark tile with rounded corners and I'll add a slight press down effect when it's clicked just to make the interaction feel a bit more tactile. With that done, let's move on to the page sections. Each section takes up the full screen and center its content both vertically and horizontally. I'll also hide any overflow so nothing spills outside the viewport during transitions. For the background layer inside every section, I'll position it behind everything else. It stretches across the full width and height and since we already handled the image styling earlier, each background will always fill the screen perfectly. And that's the base styling complete. Now before we move into the animation logic, we need to add a couple of styles that will handle the transition overlay. First of all, I'll create the base styling for the element that's going to hold all of our transition blocks. So inside the same CSS file, I'll add a class called transition grid. The grid is placed on top of everything else on the page. So I'll position it at the top left corner and fix it there. It stretches across the entire screen and has pointer events disabled, which means it never interferes with any of the content underneath. I'm also giving it a high layering order and hiding overflow to make sure none of the animated blocks spill outside the viewport when the transition plays. Next, I'll define the styling for each individual block inside that grid. Each block is absolutely positioned and I'm setting its background to the darkest color in our palette so the transition has a clean, solid look. I'll start them fully transparent as well. We'll control their opacity dynamically when we trigger the page transitions. These blocks are the pieces that will animate in and out to create that pixelated vibe effect between pages. So keeping the styling minimal and letting GSAP handle the movement gives us a lot of flexibility. And that's all we need for the transition elements. The structure is simple and everything else will be handled through JavaScript when we build the actual transition logic. Before we write any animation code, let's take a moment to look at the overall approach we are going to use for the block reveal transition. The idea is simple, whenever we move from one page to another, we'll generate a grid of small dark blocks, fade them in to cover the screen, switch the page underneath and then fade them back out in a random pattern. This gives us a clean, pixelated transition effect that feels sharp and cinematic. All of this is going to happen on the client side and GZAP will handle the entire animation flow for us. To keep everything organized, we are going to put the transition logic inside its own provider component. Providers are great for anything that needs to wrap the whole application like themes, layout effects, or in our case, page transitions because they let us run logic around route changes in a single place. So inside the source directory, I'll create a new folder called providers and inside it, I'll make a file named transition provider JSX. This will hold all the animation code for the transition effect. For now, we'll just set up the basic structure. At the top of the file, I'll enable client side rendering since we'll be interacting directly with the DOM. Then I'll define a simple transition provider component that accepts children. And for the moment, I'll just return those children exactly as they are. Nothing visual happens yet. We are simply getting the setup in place so we have a clean starting point for the animation. Next, let's head back into the layout file and import the provider there. I'll wrap the entire application inside the transition provider, placing the navigation and the page content inside it. This means the provider now surrounds every page in our app, which gives it full control over the route changes and allows our transitions to run automatically whenever we navigate between pages. And with that setup ready, we can finally go back into the transition provider file and begin building the animation system that will power the block reveal effect. Before we continue building the transition provider, we need to bring in the two packages that will power the animation system. So first of all, I'll open the terminal, we'll install two packages. 
The first is Next Transition Router. This package makes it incredibly easy to add animated page transitions in the Next.js app router. It handles route changes for us, gives us a simple leave and enter callbacks, and lets us plug in any animation library we want. The setup is minimal, and it takes care of all the behind the scenes wiring so we can focus entirely on the animation itself. The next thing we need is CSAP. We'll use CSAP to animate the transition blocks, fading them in and out, staggering them, and controlling the entire timing of the effect. Once both packages finish installing, I close the terminal. Now let's go back to our project and start setting up the provider that will power this transition. First of all, at the top of the file, I'll import the transition router from next transition router. This is the core component that will handle our base transitions. It wraps our app, listens for route changes, and gives us a place to plug in custom animations whenever we move from one page to another. Next, I'll update the JSX so that instead of returning the children directly, we wrap them inside transition router. I'll also enable the auto prop here. With this turned on, the router automatically detects internal links and triggers transitions for us without us having to use a special link component. So now, every time we click on one of the navigation links, the transition router will run our leave and enter animations around the page change and render the children in between. Now that the router is in place, we can start preparing the animation logic. So next, I'll import use ref and use effect from React. We'll use refs to store references to DOM elements and keep track of the transition blocks and we'll use an effect to set everything up when the component mounts and when the window resizes. Right below that, I'll import gsap. Inside the component, I'll start by creating a couple of refs. The first one points to the grid container that will sit on top of the page and hold all of our transition blocks. The second one is an array ref that will store all the individual block elements we create. Keeping them in a ref makes it easy to target them later with gsap. Right after defining our refs, the one for the grid container and the one for all the blocks, I'll return a single div along with children. This gives us direct access to the actual DOM node, which we need because we'll be generating all of the block elements inside it manually using JavaScript. React doesn't manage these blocks, they are created dynamically, so using a ref is the safest and cleanest way to target this element. Next, we gave it the transition grid class. Earlier, we styled this class to be a full screen overlay sitting on top of the page. That's why this div is position fixed, covers the entire viewport, and ignores pointer events. It stays invisible by default, and we only use it as a canvas for the blocks when the transition plays. So essentially, this div becomes the stage for our animation. Next, I'll define a function called create transition grid. This function will be responsible for building the grid overlay, clearing any old blocks, calculating how many we need, and then generating them dynamically based on the current window size. We call this whenever the app loads and whenever the browser is resized. Inside that function, the first thing I'll do is add a quick safety check. If the grid container doesn't exist yet, I'll simply return early and stop the function from running. This protects us from trying to access the DOM before the ref is ready. If the container is available, I'll grab it from the ref and store it in a variable. Then I'll clear out anything that might already be inside it and reset the blocks array back to an empty list. This step makes sure we are always working with a clean slate whenever we rebuild the grid. No leftover elements, no duplicate blocks, just a fresh overlay ready for the next transition. Next, I'll start by grabbing the size of the current browser window. I'll store the window's width and height in two variables. We need these measurements because the transition grid has to cover the entire screen, no matter what device or screen size the user is on. After that, I'll define a constant called block size. This is the size of each square block in the transition grid. Every block is going to be a perfect square, and this value decides how dense or how minimal the transition looks. Now that we know how big the window is and how big each block is, we can compute how many blocks we need horizontally and vertically. So next, I'll calculate the number of columns by taking the grid width, dividing it by the block size, and rounding up. We round up because if the last column spills slightly past the edge, we still need it there so the entire screen stays covered. I'll do the same for the number of rows, dividing the window height by the block size and rounding up. I'm also adding an extra row as a buffer. This solves a common issue where certain screen sizes leave a tiny gap at the bottom during the animation. This extra row guarantees we always have enough coverage. Now that we know how many rows and columns we need, we can calculate the offsets. The offset is the amount of leftover space when the grid doesn't divide evenly into the window size. For example, if the window width is not perfectly divisible by the block size, there will be a few pixels of unused space. 
Instead of letting that empty space sit on one side and making the grid look misaligned, I'll divide the leftover space in half and push the whole grid inward. So the horizontal offset centers the grid horizontally, the vertical offset centers it vertically. This ensures the entire grid sits perfectly balanced inside the viewport. Now we can actually build the grid. So I'll loop through every row and column. Inside the loop, I'll create a new div element that will represent a single block in the transition. I'll assign it the transition block class to each block. So they inherit the base CSS styles we defined earlier. Then I'll set their inline styles dynamically. The width and height both use the block size. The left position is the column index multiplied by the block size plus the horizontal offset. The top position is the row index multiplied by the block size plus the vertical offset. What this does is place every block in a precise grid pattern where each block sits exactly next to the previous one. Once the block has its size and position set, I'll append it to the grid container on the page. I'll also push the block into our ref array so we can target all of them later with GSAP. After all the blocks have been generated, I'll use GSAP to set their opacity to zero. This ensures the grid is fully invisible when the page loads. Finally, I'll run all of this when the component mounts. Inside a use effect, I'll call the create transition grid function once to build the grid initially. Then I'll add a resize listener so the grid regenerates automatically whenever the window size changes. This keeps everything responsive and prevents gaps or misalignment if the user resizes their window. And I'll clean up the resize listener when the component unmounts to avoid memory leaks. Now that the transition grid is fully set up, we can start defining what actually happens when we leave a page and when we enter the next one. So first of all, inside the transition router, I'll add a leave callback. This function runs the moment we click a link and the router prepares to switch pages. It gives us a next function and we'll only call that when our animation finishes. So this is where we hook in our block rebel effect. Inside the leave callback, I'll create a gsap tween that targets every block we stored earlier. This means every block will fade in from being fully invisible to fully visible. The duration is very short, only a fraction of a second, so the fade feels sharp instead of slow. I'm also using an easing curve to make the transition feel a bit more polished and a stagger so that the blocks don't all animate at the exact same time. Instead, GSAP spreads the animation across all the blocks over a short duration of time beginning from random positions in the grid. This randomness is what creates that glitchy, pixelated look. Once the animation finishes, GSAP runs the oncomplete callback and that's where we call next function. Calling it tells the router, okay, the screen is covered, it's safe to load the new page underneath. Finally, I'll return a cleanup function if the animation ever gets interrupted, for example, if the user navigates again really quickly, this makes sure the twin is cancelled properly. It prevents leftover animations from piling up behind the scenes. Now if you look at the demo on the side, you can see exactly what this creates. As soon as I click on a link, all of the blocks fade in and cover the entire screen in a really satisfying scatter pattern. This becomes the first half of our transition. Next, we need to define what happens when the new page comes in. So I'll add the entire callback. This function runs when the new page is ready behind the grid and it receives the same next callback we used earlier. Again, we only call it once the entire animation finishes. The first thing I'll do here is tell GSAP to make all the blocks fully visible so the screen starts completely covered. We want the new page to stay hidden until the reveal begins. Then I'll create another tween and this time we are animating the blocks back to an opacity of zero. This is the reverse of what we did in the leave animation. Instead of covering the page, we are now removing that cover and revealing the new screen underneath. The duration stays extremely short like before, so the transition feels sharp. I am using the same stagger settings as before. The blocks fade out in a randomized pattern, almost like they are dissolving away. It's the exact opposite of the leave animation, but visually it feels like one continuous effect. Once the blocks finish fading out, we tell the router the transition is complete and the page is fully visible. And just like before, I'll return a cleanup function to kill the tween if the animation needs to stop early. So now, as you can see on the side, when we leave a page, the blocks fade in to cover the screen. When we enter a new page, the blocks fade out to reveal it. Together, these two callbacks create a smooth, cinematic block reveal transition every time we navigate between pages. Hope you found the video helpful. See you in the next one.